everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Fall season is is just kicking in, so it's getting a little sleepy. Um, but we will do our best to give a lively podcast to the best of our ability. Um, I am I am joined today by is it lead preparator? Is that the best description? I yeah, that's my that's my title these days. Excellent, and I will use that lead preparator for the Museum of Art, Michael Droge. Hi, Michael. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I know thanks you're for having me. I know you're busy, yeah. so I appreciate <laughs> you so making some time. It's an unusually busy fall for me. This. This yeah. Fall, so. Yeah. I mean, the classes have just started, right? So you're, yeah. I'm sure you're, you got your hands full with that. Yeah. Classes have started. I've got a lot of uh, work with my studio practices kind of mm. um, picking up right now. And um, yeah, great. Yeah. And then work at the museum is pretty active at the moment. So. Yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, as of recording <clears throat> this, we're in the sort of last week of September, mm-hmm. I guess. Wow. Yeah. That's I scary. That I just fast. said that out loud. Yeah, that's terrifying. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've got a transition coming up in October to our, our new exhibition. So uh, we're, we're ramping up for all of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, for people listening who, who wouldn't know, I mean, what, what does a preparator do? What is that job? That's a good question. Um, a preparator um, does a lot of different things at different points during um, the museum exhibitions. Um, but primarily, a, pre- a preparator prepares artwork for... <laughs> sort of in the name, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the name, for an exhibition. Um, mm-hmm. Other jobs that, um, you know, th- those specifically like preparing work, so like pulling work along with the registrar to um, for an exhibition or for shipping out for other people's exhibitions, mm-hmm. um, packing, framing, um, basically doing a lot of the physical work around installing. Um, all of that is, is what preparators do. Um, it's a lot of, um, I would say it's the craft side of hmm. the museum work That's in terms of, of like, yeah. there's a lot of hands-on. We're, we're handling art, we're framing art, we're installing art, we're managing the, the space, we're preparing the space. Um, so there's a lot of like, yeah, it's like physical and spatial um, kind of aspects of museum work. Yeah, I think it's definitely a side of the museum that people don't think about as much when they go to see an exhibition. Um, I yeah. mean, like we've talked with um, on here before about how like the collection tends to be a really hidden part of things, but especially the, yeah, the, there's a lot of work that goes into setting up yeah, uh, like, like physical work that goes into setting those things up. So, yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of um, hands-on almost like artistic work that goes into it as yeah. well, like creative yeah. problem solving, you know, what, what should we frame this piece in how to and then the actual like aspect the actual practice of framing which is a craft you know because it's all conservation framing and archival and so there's multiple different like um things that we use that aren't necessarily even used in a commercial frame shop um because we also consider unframing things and Mm. and then there's just the 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 daily work of um working alongside the registrar for any kind of art handling or collection care or yeah right. things like that yeah um i mean you're you're segueing nicely into talking about the the challenges of being a preparator i suppose <laughs> um but how yeah so how long have you been a preparator at bates at bates i've been working here since 2011 so oh, okay. like 13 12 years yeah so you've, you've banked a lot of a lot of time um, yeah, yeah i'm kind of curious about um i mean yeah the challenges as a, as a preparator but also if, if there maybe there's a particular installation that was especially challenging um or especially rewarding that you've done you know here or elsewhere i'm just kind of yeah. curious to hear that there have been um well, usually, um, so I was thinking about that, and honestly, there was a, re- a fairly recent exhibition that we did mm. that was incredibly interesting um, and okay. and could have been very challenging, but actually went incredibly smoothly. Um, it was a Leslie Dill exhibition. Mm. I don't, mm-hmm. Were you here for that? I, I wasn't think you were here for that. Student at I think doing that. it must have been, yeah. I, I've read the... Uh, the catalog. The catalog, yeah. yeah so I, I, sort I think of it was like it. three years ago. Something like that. Yeah, it was like 2021, I think. And um, what was interesting about that exhibition is almost all the pieces were made of paper, collaged together, so Mm. they were delicate. 
and a number of them were um like costumes to put on figures hmm. but they were made of paper so um there was a lot of three-dimensional work yeah. so we had to problem solve how to hang the work from the ceilings um and how to um uh, so just like getting it all installed properly and then there was so much work mm -hmm. that um we had to use a genie which is a huge uh, scissor lift very to... very loud beeping machine yeah yes. <laughs> exactly that goes very high um yeah. and we had to use that to install so many of the pieces but then we also had to plan it really well because you couldn't move this big machine around the pieces that were hanging yeah so it was like it all had to be done in the proper sequence in order to Ooh. make it work. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds challenging for sure. Yeah. And then it was also very delicate, the work. So, mm -hmm. so that was a fairly, and then packing that work was interesting because it was packed in these mm -hmm. huge crates because it was a traveling show mm -hmm. and the, um, each costume was hung on these rods and, they had to be hung in sequence within these huge crates. So there was like a lot in the packing. Oh, it was a very creative packing situation. You're giving me some some flashbacks to, <laughs> to moves that I've yeah. made before and just <laughs> all the nightmarish details that go into that. Yeah, but... there's, a, there's a lot of considerations. Like yeah. we have an upcoming exhibition with a 700-pound sculpture, and this show I've is... I've heard about this. Yeah, and the yeah. show is traveling. So this is another challenge. Um, and it's like, how do we lift this sculpture? How do we build a pedestal mm -hmm. to hold the piece? How do we lift the piece out of its crate into and onto a pedestal without having anything underneath it because you can't slide anything out from a 700-pound sculpture? Yeah. So um, rigging wow. something up that will hold that and making sure nobody gets hurt in the meantime right. or the art and that the art is safe. Exactly. Yeah. I know, um, um, Anthony who previous listeners may, may remember, I know that he had a fairly serious injury, I think in Philadelphia, um, when he was lifting something because they, they rehearsed lifting a very heavy object as part of a move, setting up for an exhibition. Um, but they changed like who was involved when they actually did the lift itself. Oh, no. And so he ended up getting, like, the full weight of this incredibly heavy object. Oh, my God. And he didn't drop it, but he probably should have because he really hurt his back. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, my God. Uh, so, yeah. No, yeah. It, you have to be very careful. I mean, it has to be yeah. pretty systematic to, to make sure that you're you're being safe and, and yeah. make things done it's, right. Yeah. It's why we work with a crew. Yeah. And it's why we, um, we spend a lot of time talking about what we're going to do and then just, like, preparing everything yeah so that you know and like there's simple rules that most people don't think of but like don't lift anything heavy until you know where you're gonna put it yeah, yeah. like <laughs> most people are <laughs> like oh obvious. we yeah. gotta move that yeah. but then they don't know where they're going and yeah. that's yeah. like so simple like ideas like that become very important mm. and for me very interesting i mean it's what makes the job yeah somewhat interesting and challenging is um as a visual artist it's you know, it's very interesting to have all these kind of problems and sure. come up with creative solutions to yeah. them. Yeah, and how and how do I mean we have people who work on on the crew here who are who are young artists mm -hmm. in the area. How do people become preparators? What does that look like? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so the way I became a preparator is um, I was. What was I doing? I was working as a graphic designer and I had a okay. lull. I had my own business and I had a mm -hmm. lull and I picked up a job working at a museum um, and they looked at my resume and they were like, you look like a preparator and we need a preparator and you've got all the skills. And I had been okay. a framer from way back, like my first job mm -hmm. as a teenager mm -hmm. was framing. Um, so I have those skills and... Um, they offered me a job at Colgate University to be their lead preparator. Gotcha. And I, I was like, yeah, this this is fun. And I like doing it. And they sent me to a conservation school to learn conservation framing and oh, wow. hinging. And um, and that's how – and then I learned the, the director there at the time um, had been a curator at the Met. And so they mm. were very aware of best practice. And I would think so, yeah. So I learned a lot on the job. Um, you can, 
you can learn it in museum studies schools now. Mm. Um, so there are schools you can go to to learn how to be a preparator. But a lot, what happens is a lot of artists, as you know, like we need jobs because you yeah. know, steady <laughs> income doesn't happen with um, with being a studio Not artist. Typically. Yeah. And so um, at least when you're younger. And so um, it's a great job because you can freelance and you can pick up work when you want. And it usually pays fairly well. And um, usually you have all the hand skills to be able to do most of the work. Right. So yeah. um, like the two um, uh, preparators that I have working for us right now um, are, are young, as you said, emerging artists um, in, from Portland. And mm -hmm. I know them from uh, the studio building that I work in. Right. And um, I've trained them on the job to basically get the skills and... Um, so that's, that's the main way that people end up doing it, but yeah, yeah. that's why you see a lot of working artists who work as preparators in museums. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there are places like where I went where you can learn conservation skills and, right. um, you know, you could go to school for conservation, which is a whole nother career, but, um, there are people who know a lot about conservation who do preparator work too. So, Yeah. So, you know, young artists who are who are <laughs> listening, that is one way to get uh, some more uh, steady paychecks in there as well. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I, I would be remiss not to mention you are an artist, as you have alluded yep. to. Um, and, uh, I mean, I was looking over your website, which will be linked in the description so people can go and, and check that out. Um, very well organized, actually. Um, <laughs> Needs updating, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but I've it's been about a year. I've I've seen a variety more. of different approaches to that, and so yeah. Um, but yeah, I was curious if you could talk about you know what does your process look like as an artist? What what interests you? Yeah. Um, in your in your work. Well, um, one thing I will say straight off the bat is that um, all of the work that I do is connected. Mm -hmm. So working in museums is part of my practice. Uh, I teach full time and that's part of my practice. Um, and they're all interconnected. My work is research based. Um, right. I'm usually connecting with or collaborating with um, a scientist or a doctor or somebody who's who's doing work that I'm interested in yeah. that relates to some kind of social practice that I have. That's really interesting. Yeah. So right now, um, well, I mean, thank you. <laughs> right, now, right now, for the past like three years, two years, uh, a little over two years, I've been working with a scientist from Bigelow Labs in East Booth Bay. And um, mm. she is a senior scientist working... Um, working with um, deep sea microbiology and oh, man. Um, with implications of um, understanding what the impacts of deep sea, mi me deep sea mining um, does mm. to our planet and our ecosystems. Um, so that's kind of where I engage. And um, we've been working together, like I said, for a couple of years. And then recently this summer, I went on an expedition with like 28 international scientists, oh, including nice. her, um, to Costa Rica to study um, specifically this octopus nursery, which they discovered. Um, and usually octopus live alone, and these these brooding mamas were con like thousands of them together yeah. with, um, with babies and, um, you know, with, like with eggs. And so they were... Curious why they were all together, and it turns out um, they discovered it's because of these heat vents that are in the area. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're discovering new things about these these creatures and about their habits and ways of life and where they need to be in the, it, on the planet and the bottom of the ocean. And um, they can't just do that anywhere. They have to be in these specific ecosystems. So, right. um, so that was like big and all over the news and... Um, yeah. it's a huge discovery, but, um, it's part of these ongoing explorations of the deep sea, which we know very little about, but also which yeah. holds amazing amounts of the minerals and metals that we need for solar and for solar panels and yes. electric cars and computers and things like that. Yes. So there's this conflict of interest and a need for us to understand these places before we destroy them. 
um, yeah. hopefully not destroy them. Yeah. So No, uh, marine science was my uh, qualitative credit as a Bates student. Oh, so, so there you go. I, I, so you know a lot about this stuff. I have no an doubt. overview of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's really, it's fascinating. And it's yeah. um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Mm-hmm. Like the deep sea is like incredible as, as they've, as they were exploring. Um, and I was on that boat. I was like just odd every second of the day and um yeah all that information fuels and inspires the paintings i do and then we do um and i'm doing some video work as well and we do um exhibitions and give um give like public talks to talk about like the impacts and so there's this collabor this ongoing collaboration which is a really big part of my work whether it's that or i've dealt with like yeah opiate issues and Mm, mm -hmm. made work around that um did a collaboration with um sarah loftus uh archaeologist who um and who was studying farm tools and we Mm -hmm. did a a project based on the um nine different farms in maine and their hand tools and did cyanotypes with them and made a book about that so yeah um i mean yeah i was looking over uh the list of this long list of research and, and work that you've that you've done um and there's one i have to ask about okay sure yeah because uh i studied classics at bates oh yeah i saw okay. sappho's ghosts yeah uh which sappho for people who, who don't know is a was a uh an ancient greek um poet her work survives um really only in fragments for the most part i mm-hmm. think there's only one complete poem that sappho has it's it's very minimal surviving material yeah um but it's deeply fascinating, mm-hmm. um, and she was very popular um, in uh, both both in ancient Greece and in, in continuing reception. Um, and so, I really wanted to hear about what inspired you about about that into turning it into into paintings and into work. Yeah, well, that's um, that's a great question. That project, um, I think I did it in 2011. Mm-hmm. And, um, Sorry, I'm pulling you back. No, yeah, no, yeah. no. That's okay because it's it's all part of what I do. And um, one of the things that I'm I have been and still am really fascinated in is making work um, inspired by poetry and by literature and by mythology. Hmm. And um, especially being half Greek, um, uh. I have roots in the Greek mythology. There you go. Yeah. And um, so I have this kind of draw for that. And I also I'm just really interested in Greek mythology. I went to Boston Latin School, got a lot of like oh, there you go. Yeah. Latin also. So <laughs> um, I was just like, that's just part of who I am at this point. It's in my fabric. And um, so um, I was reading Ann Carson, who uses a lot of Greek mythology in yes. her poetry and in her essays. And is like just this incredibly inspiring author, poet, essayist. And yeah. um, really interesting translator. Makes translation into a really interesting yeah, practice. Yeah, exactly. And that series of paintings, just to bring it back to your question, um, is based on Ann Carson's book, If Not, Comma, Winter, which mm-hmm. is um, a translation of Sappho's poems that are, um, because like, as Peter said, they're, um, they're not, they exist in fragments. Um, she Ann Carson left a space in the translation, like you know, on the paper, so that mm-hmm. there's like you can see the absence of the words that were once written but aren't there anymore. And so she, it's a very moving um, translation mm. of these po- the, of these poems, and um, I was very inspired by them and very moved by them, and I made. I think there's there's five of them. I think it's five. I think there was yeah. a total of six, but one of them sold before I got a, a shot of it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. That's a, I guess that's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah I think right. so. Yeah, and they're they're all out there in the world. Um, they've been published recently in a book of poetry. I should have brought it with me, but um, hmm. if anybody is interested, you can contact Peter and I'll yes. Give him, I'll give him a copy of the book so he can tell you where to get it. But it's yeah, it's exactly. published by Literal Books here in Maine, L I T T O R A L, and I just the name of the um, author's um, 
yeah, slipping we, well, my mind. We can find that and see if we can put it down in the in the description below. So we'll see yeah. if we can dig that up in the Okay, in the I'll definitely that, so. Yeah, I yeah, can yeah. get it for you today. So Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that one, um I also did a series of drawings based on Heraclides. Yes, I saw that as well. Fragments. So I was yeah. really interested in these ancient Greek uh, philosophers and poets yeah. who also had this like idea of fragmentation mm-hmm. in the work that we have of theirs now. So it wasn't part of their intention, but it was part of how we perceive that work. Yeah, it plays a major role in how you read it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Piecing apart all those those little sort of it's almost like um, putting together a puzzle with half the pieces. It's sort of you can see yeah. some of the image, but yeah, um, and it kind of references like ideas by. Um, uh, like William Burroughs, the way he worked mm-hmm. with words and like ripped them up and put them back together. So, I mean, there's just <laughs> this whole interesting kind of oh, tradition yeah. in poetry and literature um, that's maybe like, well, Burroughs, it was more intentional with these right. guys, it, with Heraclides and Sappho, it was just time that was mm-hmm. the influence. But um, overall, I think that's a really fascinating part of the whole thing, the, yeah. the absence of something that still feels very present. That is really cool. <laughs> um, wow. So, I mean, where can people find your your work? Is there is there a way people to find that? Uh, well, I'm actually working on um, an exhibition in the new multimedia space at Corum. Oh, uh, here at so Bates. cool. Yeah. So that'll be opening. Um, we haven't got the exact date yet, but it's either early December or mid January or oh, maybe great. both. I'm not sure yet, but, um, so that's opening soon. Awesome. Um, and that will be, uh, lots of video from the deep sea as well as video and sound from uh, on the deck of the boat and, mm-hmm. um, layered with, um, I'm collaborating with, um, Asha Tamarin and yeah, Carolina yeah. and, um, uh, Tristan Kopke, so like we're sure. gonna have some performance with that. So that's gonna be an immersive wow. um, multimedia exhibition, and then the rest of my work right now is gonna be showing out of state, like in Miami at Miami Basel. And, okay. Um, that's in December, and then I believe it's going to Chicago and Hawaii. Gotcha. So Okay. Well, if anybody's listening in <laughs> Miami, <laughs> Chicago, or Hawaii, you'd be surprised. Uh, yeah. Check it out. Um, yeah. But yeah, and also, obviously, anything coming up in the museum, you will know that, that Michael has played a role in it. Yeah, so. I've at least touched all the art. So. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Thank you so much for coming on. This yeah, great. thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Take care. Bye.